So how many uh, approaches are there? We're familiar with three basic approaches, but there uh, are seven of them overall. And most of the approaches that are in addition to the three that are familiar to us are more open approaches, such as the anterior, uh, the, the uh, superior approach, or anything that's done through the, these go, date all the way back to the first posterior approach was done in 1908 by C.F. Painter. And so there's common approaches from, uh, from Smith, Peterson, and Gainsland, and these are open, uh, and you'll, they will take a gluteal flap so the subgluteal approach, either through the, reflecting the gluteus uh, maximus and medius off, or just straight through the ilium. And so these are all derivations of that, using bone plugs or hardware, uh, plugs that are extraneous or taken from um, the person itself, for like as demonstrated by Gianicus. Uh And then we have anterior column, and these are all done open through the anterior column using uh, either graphs or hardware, and these are laterally placed fixation. Uh, this is done, Mark Riley's the guy that invented uh, uh, this as well for SI bone, and this is a lateral placed triangular titanium rod, and this is what we're familiar with more today. And then all the uh, posterior uh, intra-articular distraction arthrodesis, and these are various methods of doing this uh, inside the joint, outside including the extra articular recess uh, and this is kind of the modern version of doing this i'll show you an example of that today this is a an open approach uh, and then of course the extra articular approach that goes across the joint so there's a lots of different ways to do this that explains the seven different approaches and the si fusion has been done for a very long period of time uh, the three approaches we're going to talk about today uh, are better than the open approaches. They have better operative parameters, shorter hospital stays, less operative time, and efficacy that's even better than some of the open approaches. And so we'll talk about the posterior approach, the extra articular approach, the posterior inferior approach, which we'll demonstrate in the lab today. And as I mentioned, this is an old approach. I and mean, then this is done in 1908, uh, the guy, spent 33 days in the hospital, and this is a resection of the, what, uh, the ilium, they call this the innominate bone, or the resection of the PSIS, and to resect that bone and pack it into the, uh, the SI joint after decorticating that, and this is a very morbid type procedure, as you would imagine. Uh, the modern day version of this is an extra articular access to go down posteriorly, and this is, a screw called the Nadia screw. This is a very large uh, 20 millimeter screw. It's also uh, 3D printed and textured. And so this is cannulated. Obviously you can see the hole through it. And this is designed to be placed in the extra articular recess along the lines of force, along the lines of force from the ilium all the way down to the femur through the SI joint. And this is commonly packed with lots of bone graft. Uh, we use bone morphogenic protein is also used uh, commonly in this procedure, and this is where it's placed. The extra articular recess or the membranous ligamentous portion of the joint is back here. And this is where it's placed, it's, and it's angled toward the femoral head along the lines of force from the ilium all the way down to the proximal femur. And this is really done, the one I just showed you uh, is, is done primarily by uh, using a technique uh, popularized by John Stark. These are um, uh, Fuchs and Rule. This is a, another version of the distraction arthrodesis. You can see nice fusion rates here, but the uh, rate of fusion was only in the, the range of the 70%, so it wasn't great, and pain function quality life scores were reasonable but not outstanding. So posterior inferior approach, the biggest advantage to the posterior or dorsal or posterior inferior approach is its safety. So here's the uh, down the barrel of the SI joint. And if you take it, and this is an example of one of mine that I've done a lateral approach on. You'll see this again. You'll also see a demo of this. But there's nothing to hit. If you go down the barrel of the joint, right down parallel to the joint, you go out. What muscle is this? This is the iliacus, and this is the psoas. And you don't even have bowels. So you can go all the way out here, really. But you can rest assured that commonly you will have uh, the left colon. 
right, sitting right there, the descending colon. So there's really not much to hit. The neurovascular bundle will be uh, medial to this. And this right here is the lumbosacral trunk uh, or the lumbosacral plexus. So the farther down it goes, it becomes from the lumbosacral trunk to the plexus. And so the thing that you have to worry about is that right there. That's primarily an L5 nerve injury waiting to happen if you hit it. But on the dorsal approach, it's not in the line of fire. So here's a typical AP view. This is an outlet view. This is a oblique outlet view and placing <coughs> the wire across there along lines of the SI joint, accessing it between S1 and S2. And this is the sacral ala right here. This is the sacral body. That's the sacral promontory. So these are very different structures. The last two I mentioned are in the middle. The other ones are on the side. And this is uh, an oblique view, an outlet ob oblique view to access it and placing the joint finder followed by the working channel on the, the tines on the outside toward this part of the sacral ala down the barrel of the AP, uh, the joint, the SI joint. And the bone graft dowel, and this will be demonstrated by Dr. Naidu, is placed here. So that, very briefly, is the dorsal or posterior approach or the posterior inferior approach. And here's what it looks like. This is placed directly into the joint. This is a distraction arthrodesis. This is a bone dowel. And here's what it looks like on CT scan with the, the fusion already starting. And this was at three months post-placement already starting to see fusion. So the posterior lateral approach uh, is a different type of approach using the same views. We have an outlet view with the II uh, tilted cranially. So here's the marker with the outlet view. You can see the S1 neural foramen. And this is an ipsilateral uh, outlet oblique view. And this is seen down the uh, trajectory of the joint. And this is oblique. This is the posterior portion of the ilium. And this is where the, the screw will fit flush up against this border right here. And this is the inlet view. This is somebody, this is the most underutilized view in SI joint fusion. You have to be able to be facile and you must use the inlet view. And this is the way that you see this part right here. On a perfect inlet view, the internal portion of the pelvis would be circular. The, the sacrum will be superimposed upon itself and you get a very sharp line right here. And this is what you're looking to avoid. That's a lumbosacral trunk. Up high, farther down, it's the lumbosacral plexus. And this is exactly the position that you do not want to hit. And here's an example of posterolateral screws that are placed. So very briefly, that's the posterolateral approach. Here is another example of screws. Uh, this is my case, somebody with a long segment fusion. These are posterolateral screws placed in here. And then this is seen in the trajectory. The advantage, the main advantage to the posterolateral approach is the entry zone is just medial to the gluteal muscles. This is the gluteus max, gluteus med, and this is placed just medial to that. So it does not go transmuscular. The main advantage of the posterolateral approach. Then the lateral approach, here's what the lateral approach looks like. The trajectory is through the muscles, through the gluteal muscles. Uh, the Trajectory goes in from a jam sheety, uh, then the Steinman pin through the jam sheety, and it's all dilation after that. So rigid access, the rest of it's dilation, uh, transmuscular. Here's the points of access. You want to go in the middle of the body of S1. You want to go to the middle of the body of S2. The junction between S1 and S2, that's where the frame and sets. And your start point can be right here. This is the body. This is the promontory. This is the sacral ala. And to be able to recognize these anatomic structures is extremely important. Uh, sacral pelvic anatomy is not lumbar anatomy. It's very different. It's more difficult. L1 is not S1. L1 is constant. You pick an L1, it's going to be L1. You pick an S1 and everybody here, it'll be different. 80% of the people here will have an S1 that's different shape, different sizes. Sometimes it will be vestigial. Uh, Transistal lumbosacral anatomy is about the same incidence of the, as the incidence of blue eyes in the United States, so it's quite common. So middle portion of S1, middle portion of S2, the junction here. This is, is the top of the ala. This is the sacral promontory. That's in the middle. Don't go there. And if you miss on a lateral view, it's like a, a brushback pitch from Nolan Ryan. It's going to be high and inside, and both you and the patient will hurt greatly. So that's where you, you miss. You, 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 you 
maintain targets by staying in the middle and toward the posterior portion here. That's where we, this is the bone corridor. If you start in the ilium over here, you can come out the ilium or the skin on the other side and not hurt anything as long as you stay in the bone corridor. And so the trajectory on this is really defined by the bone corridors. This is great outlet view, is it not? Uh, S1 bone corridor, S2 bone corridor, S1, S2, S3 neural foramina. And this is an outlet view, right? With the, with the II tilted very cranially. This is the II tilted caudally. And this is a pelvic inlet view. Know this view, love this view, become familiar with it because it will help you greatly doing SI fusion. This is the border of the trajectory. You don't want to go too far anterior as I mentioned previously. This is the spinal canal, don't hit that. And this is how you go in through the pelvic inlet view. It's very nice. And so typically we'll go through a couple of systems here. We're gonna demonstrate for posterolateral and lateral zavation and the genesis. And so these will both have areas where you put the dilator one in and this will size it and it will tell you the size of the screw. And then you have a drill that's a little bit smaller than the size of the screw, a little bit shorter. So it undersizes a little bit and you place it over a Steinman pin. And then after the driver is taken out, this, the, this is the pin guide, and this tells you it's an easy access to the S2 or the foraminal screw, depending on whether you put two or three screws in. And this is nice, but it's bigger than my incision, so I don't ever use it. I freehand it because my incision is about 10 or 12 millimeters. It's a very small, elegant incision. So typically this will be uh, 11, 11 and a half, 12 and a half, depending on the size of the screw in the system by, by 60 or by 50. This is the middle of S1, middle of S2. And we always, I always try to put three screws in. So this is a typical screw one, screw two. Uh, you can use a third screw. You, it's a sh short screw because you have to uh, aim it toward the framing. So this is uh, nine and a half. I don't necessarily like to do that, but I show this because one of the few times where I've had to put a nine and a half screw in, you can actually fit it between the other screws or you can put two screws in S1. And that's typically the technique taught by SI bone with the triangular titanium bars. So you have uh, one or two. This is a hybrid approach. This is an old fashioned cannulated screw. Uh, put two in here. And these are cervical cages that are packed in at the bottom of S2. This is for uh, people with very bad instability. Typically people with SI joints are incredibly unstable. Or this can be done as a revision. So this is a revision. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, did this very recently. This was in the past uh, few months. Nothing wrong with this uh, triangular titanium bar fusion. This, there's no lucency. So this is not loose. It just wasn't enough to stop this joint from moving adequately. So uh, I just did a dorsal approach to go back to a previous approach and placing it inferior uh, and anterior to the three triangular titanium bars. Uh, and there's another example of uh, having an adjunct of a lateral fusion with a posterior fusion with evidence of osseous union 18 months after. Both these patients did fantastic pain went from a roughly a seven to a zero to one afterwards. And so all of these approaches are viable, but we really focus on the three main approaches uh, for the minimally invasive because it really is better than some of the open uh, types of procedures. So uh, we'll talk about three out of the seven. Each one has its pros and cons. Each one can be used together. Uh, so a posterior approach can be used with the posterior lateral or lateral to form a hybrid approach. These techniques are all done with floral guidance. Some people like to use navigation. Uh, some of my colleagues like to use CT for this, but they can all be done with fluoroscopic guidance. The three main views, inlet, outlet, and lateral, and these are the standard techniques are very uh, well established and, and well done. The points to stay away from are also very well defined. And these can be done alone or in combination for a hybrid approach. And my suggestion to you, if you don't do SI fusion, is try it, you'll like it. And with that, we'll open it up to questions or comments. Uh, yes. Uh, how about the allograft, using allograft for fusion? Yeah, so the allograft was, um, I showed you a couple of examples of that. All those bone were, those were all allografts. So everything I showed you here was, yeah. Perfect, it works perfectly well. 
The newest data on this is from the SECURE trial, and it had almost exactly identical improvements in pain and function as did the INSIGHT and IMEA and SCIFI trial from SI Bone level one trial. So it's, it's a very effective way to do this. Yes. When you use the terminology distraction, uh, do you expect osseous fusion in these eventually? I think so. I hope so. And some of the ones that I showed you are, are uh, evidence of that. They will incorporate, you have to get down to bleeding bone. Um, you know, the allograft and whenever you put a bone graft like this in, whether it be uh, foot and ankle, whether it be cervical spine, uh, there's a certain rate of non-union that comes along with this. And so it, let's say we have an allograft we put in the SI joint and it gets a non-union, what do you do? Uh, the best thing about the allograft is it's allograft and it softens up after about 18 months. And I've had to revise, uh, I don't know, in the past five years I may have done 25 revision uh, SI joint fusions from various and sundry places, most of which I don't know the person that did the initial one. But the allograft revisions I have done, I do it with a lateral revision, and it's uh, very easy to put a large lateral screw in, even through an existing allograft. So it's, it's no problem to revise. Are there distraction techniques that do not incorporate allograft, where it's purely just the distraction? And if so, is there any degree of loosening expected over the long term, over a decade, say, uh, because of the ligaments? Yeah. So the distraction arthrodesis that are best known are the ones that are done by, uh, I showed you, Fuchs and Rule, also uh, Wise, Bruce Dahl. Um, the one that I showed you that was done by John Stark, the really big screw, it's called the Nadia screw. The precursor to that is called the Daughter screw. This is done primarily in Europe. These are big time distraction arthrodesis, but done with screws. And they are, have a large amount of bone graft that's packed in there, usually uh, also BMP, bone morphogenic protein, something to get it to, to uh, fuse. And yeah, I mean, once these things are fused, they stay fused, and they stay fused forever. And this is, uh, the, the ilium is, is great fusion graft. And if you can get down to bleeding bone in the sacrum and the ilium, it's really good. The non-unions almost always happen on the sacral side, not the ilium side. But once it's fused, it's, it's good forever.